Hello and welcome to the 21st Century Work Life Podcast, where we talk about how the world of work and our attitudes to work are changing. This show is brought to you by Virtual Not Distant, a London-based company where we help teams and organizations transition to an office-optional approach. To have a look at what we do and the show notes to our podcast episodes, head over to virtualnotdistant.com. Thank you for spending your time with us. Hello and welcome to episode 210 of the 21st Century Work Life Podcast. And today's episode is all about planned spontaneity. So, well, it's not all about that. We've got a huge, um, as always, what's going on section. But today's episode, well, I have with me co-host Maya Middlemiss. Hello, Maya. Hello, Pilar. Hello, everybody. <laughs> I might be a little bit distracted because I have a new toy. I have oh. a, a Samsung <laughs> Android tablet to guide me through the show notes, which is the, the most important uh, thing um, because my <laughs> iPad was so old, it, was, um, it didn't really work. So I've got this, so I might be a little bit distracted with it. So let's get, let's get to it, listeners, uh, <laughs> for a change. Let's go on to the what's going on section. So we've got quite a lot of things, very varied, don't we, Maya? Mm, yes, lots is, lots of things are going on. <laughs> we've got some stuff on uh, co-working, we have some stuff on tech, and we have some high-level uh, stuff. So I thought we'd start with just really just a nudge to our friends at Our Labs, because they've just released the State of Remote Work 2019. And something I think is really interesting is how many of these reports have come up this year as opposed to other yeah. years. Yes, there's lots of people investigating this. There's lots of research coming out. Um, for those of us who've been in the space for a long time, in some ways it's validating what we already knew, but it's fascinating to see how many people are looking at it. Yeah. So um, just to say, of course, that our labs, uh, they have a, a meeting owl, so they have a vested interest in the remote space. So we always need to be looking at that. But they, they haven't really looked at stuff like meetings or anything that promotes their product in this one, I think. So... What struck me is the variety of this word uh, remote and what it is mm. to work remotely. And it echoes something that listeners won't have he heard yet, uh, which is uh, Lila, who was our guest in last uh, two weeks ago episode, in her full interview, when I was talking to her, she said um, the word remote is very loaded now because it means so many different things. And we were thinking, well, maybe we need different words. So that's what really struck me from as I was going through this report is that there's so many ways of doing remote work and so many setups that uh, I'm, I'm starting to get a bit lost in what any of the data <laughs> means, to be completely honest, listeners. It's very difficult to compare data meaningfully across different setups or different pieces of research. But I think it's, it's partly it's reflecting the fact that it is becoming more normal, that things start to diversify and fragment within that. And that maybe there's just a, a better understanding and acceptance of decoupling work from where you do it. So people are interpreting that in hugely different ways. Mm. And I like that they've got, uh, to, to your point also, we're starting to talk salary. So we're starting mm. to think of remote workers in whatever context as people who um, who have salaries for a start. We're moving away mm. from that outsourcing uh, to, to other regions uh, that we used to have some years ago. And also that um, it's it's equitable, that it's not something you, in, in organizations, there is often a fear of, especially as you get higher up the ladder, that if you are not present in the office, that it will have an impact on your career and all the things. So yeah. it's good to just have it there to see, well, okay, there is a range, just like with any other job. Yes. And the huge diversity of industries reflected as well. Um, putting those two factors together, it really underlines the fact that you don't have to choose between flexibility and a successful career. 
in pretty much any vertical you want. They've got a great many covered here. It'd be interesting, listeners, if there's anything there that you think is interesting that surprised you, we'd love to hear from you, virtualnotdistant.com, or you can tweet us at virtual teamwork with a zero instead of an O. Is there anything else there that you wanted to comment on, uh, Maya? No, but we'll definitely put this link into the show notes because there's so much to dig into there. And I think different listeners will get different things out of it and recognize different aspects of the way they work within it when they have a look. Like uh, they've got some uh, a section on similarities of uh, opinion and attitude and differences. It's really well laid Mm. out. So well done, our labs. (laughs) Yes. Very good. Right. So how do we go in this new tablet? (laughs) Oh, the shiny new gear. You have to learn the rules of how to play with it. (laughs) Shall we? go uh, shall we go from high level to low level so we'll we'll end with uh, the tech which uh, let's okay. let's face it um although i have a huge thing just to end with um but shall we do you want to take us through the um, the article um <laughs> the yahoo <laughs> which article. one are we looking at the yahoo yeah. one okay well this just goes to show that the old cliche about lies, damned lies and statistics, because we've just looked at the research from our labs about remote being the future and everybody's doing it and everybody's loving it. Um, uh, And now we we have another set of research that says that remote workers have work more and have less work-life balance than office employees. So it really just goes to show how difficult it is to compare research meaningfully. This was research um, by Airtasker, which is an online platform connecting consumers with gig workers. So immediately the mention of gig workers to me defines a subset of remote and flexible work that is very far from the full picture that we've just looked at in in the other set of research. But basically they, they seem to have found that remote workers have a poorer quality of experience than those based in the office. Um, let's pull out some Nearly one third of remote workers said they struggle to achieve work-life balance despite working from home, um, while only 23% of office employees felt that way. And millennial employees who work remotely are seen as more likely to struggle with work-life balance, as nearly one in three respondents described that as a challenge. So I mean, we talk a lot about work-life balance in the content we create at Virtual Not Distance, and it is a perennial struggle, but it's not one that's limited to remote workers by any degree. We talk about the the, the relationship between work li- work life and life not work life. Uh, I, I, I struggle with the balance because <laughs> I think yeah, it, but the- it's about something more dynamic and blended than that for most people. And maybe if you're trying to see it as a balance, that's where you're going to fall off. Yeah, well, different. Some people want it to be a balance. Other people want it to be an integration. Other people don't. You know, the the work is what drives them and the life. So what, what we look at mm-hmm. is, is health. Um, uh, and health at work, um, and and healthy healthy lifestyle and healthy relationship between between the two. I still think we need to find a better term than work life. Yeah, we do because it it implies a dichotomy that doesn't yes. exist anymore. And maybe if you're craving those hard edges, that's why you have a poorer experience because it doesn't reflect the reality anymore. Um, I went back to the original uh, research, which is linked to in the article. So uh, this is uh, research from September the 9th, 2019. And once more, like the Owl Labs um, uh, data, it is US-based. This one has 1,000 full-time employees. The other one had uh, 2,000, I think. And half of the people were remote in this one. Something interesting that I thought actually is, is pertinent, and we might come back to it, during the conversation in the main part today is um, the the bit about relationships. So pressing priorities, giving priorities. So they say, which do you prioritize at work? Uh, co-worker relationships and my work equally, that's 70%. And then some people prioritize mm. co-working. And then it says the average, average total daily time discussing non-work related topics with co-workers 29 minutes for remote, 66 minutes for office. And then by position, no managers, 38 versus managers, 69. I, I thought, I, don't, I, I think it's fascinating that, that difference. It is. And I wonder how they measured it because it's the kind <laughs> of thing that I think most of us would find very difficult to self-report accurately and meaningfully. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. And I think, yeah, we can come back to that in, um, in our conversation about plant yeah. spontaneity. 
Definitely, because there's loads in this research, actually, far more than the Yahoo News article picked up on. Oh, work-life balance. Um, There's actually so much more in this research, some really interesting statistics about things like how much people exercise when they work remotely compared to being in the office, how much um, they save on fuel and travel expenses and all sorts of different factors that that have an impact on that balance and that remote well-being overall. And the stuff on distractions, I mean, just what we were talking about, there's mm. a little bit more on distractions. It's really interesting. Really interesting listeners. Have a look. Yeah. Nice one. Uh, yes, it's much more interesting than the news report, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And it's got nice graphics. <laughs> yes, yes. So good. Nice. So from that to co-working, which uh, it's interesting that we do end up talking about co-working. I think it really goes hand in hand with a more flexible and location independent lifestyle. Um, mm. And I came across, um, so I've got two things I wanted to share with you, Maya, and listeners. One is an article that's actually from back in April, and it's uh, it's <laughs> it's called the newest her oh, the newest hot co working space costs just two twenty five dollars an hour <laughs> because it is a parking spot. That's really funny. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, this is before all the WeWork stuff and everything. This this seems like um, ages ago. It's just April of this year. Um, but yeah, it is exactly that. It is about uh, a, a, a co-working, a, a car working community, which basically was saying it's an initiative that says so. Uh, what if we use parking for anything else? And they um, well, they just enabled people to work from the car park course the pictures are all of a sunny thing and stuff like that i just thought that worry well, but yes that would work in san francisco maybe not every day in london perhaps just from a weather point of view <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um so yes i think i think this was an initiative i haven't heard anything more about it and as well as i say it was a, um some time ago and um i think it was a one-off uh, it, it says a we work we park that's what they called it <laughs> Well, um, it was certainly a bit tongue in cheek. I'm quoting now directly, but the urgency of what it was actually drawing attention to took precedent. We had people come through who didn't have an office because they work for themselves or from home who couldn't afford co-working, but like the idea mm. of having a work community. Yeah, lots of interesting stuff in that. The first is the idea of co-working becoming unaffordable Mm. because it was supposed to be a low-cost replacement for traditional office setups. Uh, But I also just really like the humanity of it. It sort of chimes in with a lot of the um, climate change protests and so on, people taking over spaces that vehicles had claimed and claiming them back to do something that's about spontaneous human connection. And it's, it's getting cars off the road because you don't need them to drive to an office when you can just have your co-working in the middle of the street. So <laughs> I, I rather like it. <laughs> and it's, it, it's encouraging creativity and really saying, yeah. look, we really think that it doesn't matter where you work from. That's not the point. So any space could do if you're comfortable. Yeah, um, if you've got a desk and some Wi-Fi uh, and some sunshine, if you're going to be outside, then why not? Yes. What what does worry me is this um, this thing of uh, people who couldn't afford co-working, but like mm. the idea of having a work community. Um, and it goes back to, of course, um, building community at work and the problem of isolation, etc. But I think it really, the reason why it worries me is because it reflects that sometimes there isn't any thought going behind decisions to enable or demand that people work from home. Um, yeah. and, and sometimes actually, I, I don't know if I've told you this before or, or, or if I'd said it on the podcast, a friend of mine who was in Spain looking for um, options for her people because they had to expand the office and she was thinking, well, do we want to rent more real estate or buy more real estate? And she said, had a look at the co-working spaces. I think we're just going to hire a bigger office. <laughs> and right <laughs> yeah so uh, the, the fact that like you're saying that the, the the office might eventually be a cheaper option than co-working spaces or having people uncomfortable at home um and well we'll we shall you know we shall see <laughs> we shall see it's sort of coming full circle yes. isn't it um and again it is that sort of detaching the work from the location means you can explore all these different permutations whether that's working at home or working in a car park or, or whatever but it yeah and and now since this this particular piece was published in april we've had the whole thing with the the we work valuation and then withdrawal and it 
it does feel like it's in a bit of a state of flux at the moment, what's going to happen about office space and office optionalism, um, yes. particularly in cities where real estate is really expensive, commuting is expensive and difficult and polluting, and people are exploring lots of different options. So it's something we'll have to keep an eye on. And I met someone at an event who um, was representing a new kind of co-working. I think it's a brilliant, brilliant idea. I'm not sure how it works. I haven't tried it. So the platform, it's a UK-based platform. It's called andco.life. And basically, mm. they're teaming up with spaces that already exist as social spaces like cafes, hotels. I don't know if private clubs. I haven't really looked through the website very much. And what they do is um, they've got work, uh, work desks there, allocated spaces for work. You book through the app. And when you get to that cafe, you have your space reserved for you. Sometimes they have um, a free coffee that goes with it, etc. The company has its own Wi-Fi, so you're not just using the Wi-Fi mm. from the cafe. This is dedicated, and also they're trying to encourage community. So I think I, I can't, I didn't quite see how they're doing that yet, um, but it's probably through their app. But you can, um, yeah, you can you can check out other people who are there also through the app and and build your community that way. And I thought. I really like that. It, yeah, oh. it's nice, isn't it? Sort of decentralized, grassrootsy feel about it that it's it's people can be really flexible and drop in and out, and but still be part of something. Yeah, and if you work, um, it's it, at the moment it's twenty pounds a month. Uh, and right. if you travel, so for example, instead of being part for, of a bigger co-working thing where actually membership can be quite expensive to be using mm. different um, locations, if you travel and you can find in each city, whatever, one or two spaces that do this, it's also nice. It gives, it's going back to that sense of belonging. It's some sense of belonging. Yes. Okay. Maybe there's not. And that's what people want from a co-working, isn't it? The thought of being able to find that around the world or yeah. you know, even around a city is lovely. And actually 20 pounds a month, when you compare that to in the last article we were looking at saying that <laughs> an affordable option for co-working was two fifty an hour. Yeah. Um, this is very, very competitively priced by comparison. Yeah, it's really good. So listeners, if any of you have used this, uh, it's very, very, very niche. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there was a lot of other chances, but we'd love to is, hear. Is it just London at the no, moment? No, it's the UK. It um, but okay, for example, I couldn't, interesting. I couldn't find anywhere in Birmingham, for example, yet. Um, right. Okay. It's one of those things that's kind of going to depend on a critical yes. mass of people using it, I think, just to generate the, the, you know, like Uber and all of these other kind of crowd based things. You've got to have enough supply and demand on both sides to make it work. So it, yeah, definitely worth having, having a dabble with. There's another one I'm aware of in the US that's similar, which is Coco which is, it's US based, but they've, they've got funding to roll out and do something more global, wow. which I think is going to look at something similar to this, but also um, with things like accessible childcare and other options for people to work flexibly and just turn up somewhere around the world and find somewhere to plug into. So a lot of this is coming from the users, I think, and what people want. So maybe rather than being pessimistic about it, it's a question of, I, I, I can be optimistic, but knowing that it's going to be mm. different. To what we're used yes, to. Yes, different and, and coming from what people want rather than the top down we work type approach. Mm. Um, I think this is, this is really nice. It's, it's reflecting that diversity of what, what people, people want different things from their workspaces. And that includes the flexibility to find them where they are. So yeah, it'd be great to see how these kind of initiatives pan out. Excellent. So let's uh, move on to the little tech news. Uh, we've got some stuff, uh, probably um, Slack specific, but as always, it will have mm. a broader implication. So you put this one in and I think, um, yeah, I've got something to say about it also. <laughs> yeah, well, it was a, an update came from Slack. It was on their blog and it was mainly about tools for business administrators. So people on big play paid plans with Slack. Um, and one of the things that caught my eye was a, a feature to bulk invite members to a channel with user lists. You'll soon be able to invite up to a thousand users at once to any channel by pasting a list of emails or display names. Um, and that just it kind of made me <laughs> shudder, actually, the thought of, of being in a channel with a thousand users or being in a Slack workspace with a thousand users, um, really. And it, but it made me think that obviously... Slack is now becoming used in that way, which is not how it started, perhaps, but it's clearly where the monetization is coming from from them. And then how on earth do you manage that conversation in a Slack channel with a thousand new users being added at once? 
I think that Slack and Microsoft Teams and equivalents are becoming, are going to replace the intranet, the mm, the place yeah. where people look for information. So all these announcement channels and stuff like that, which are really, they are about a, a centralized way of communicating. I think we're going to see more of those. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really disappointed with the way all of that is going. Um, I think these these platforms for me were a different way of communicating, a different way of enabling people in organizations to have meaningful conversations online rather than taking the broadcast approach that we're used to. Yeah. And I, this makes me very sad. <laughs> yeah, it just, I think it makes me... Yes, it makes me glad that I don't work in a big organization anymore <laughs> because the last time I, I did was a, a long time before Slack and the thought of, yeah, a, there were a thousand people who might have shared a, a common room or canteen in a building that I use, but they wouldn't all be talking at once. <laughs> That's the difference. Not in, in my desk. Well spotted. <laughs> just shut them off. Yeah, yeah, well spotted because this is the thing is that um, the these tools work really well. One, when there's no loads of people in them. And the other one is when we're segmenting the conversation. But what will tend yeah. to happen is that, yeah, you get that. You don't get segmentation. You just get lots of noise. So, yeah, good point. Oof. Yeah. And at, in the end, people are going to therefore go around it because you won't put anything meaningful in a Slack channel with a thousand users that you need people to have definitely seen yeah. or to respond to or interact with. So you're going to go outside of that channel for the important stuff yeah. or the specific stuff. So whether that turns out to be a smaller private group or, God, maybe we'll go back to email. Oh, yes, definitely. No, <laughs> yes. I can tell you now that that's, that's just, if it's not happening already, it's about to happen. Yeah, yeah of course. Um, the, the other thing um, I've noticed, and, and Maya, I think also that there is, um, I think some people like intimate spaces for communication other people like the feeling that there's lots of people around so i think maybe this is maybe some people will uh, like this especially if slack is being used outside the workspace for community some people like to have lots of people there's a thousand people in our channel um and what's yeah. happening now this is something worth noting if you haven't noticed before and you're a slack user i've noticed this in virtual team talk that now, when we invite someone into the space, they appear immediately in the general channel, even before they've accepted the invitation. Mm. So that, again, is like, okay, this person's been invited, they're here now, but they're not even activated yet. And what does that tell me about the people I'm interacting with? Now, I don't even know if people are there or not. Yeah, it is just like passing someone in a building that yes. you haven't been introduced to yet or something. And if that's that's where Slack is, and these huge community tools are going, then... I don't know if that's if that's what we want in our teams. Again, we always talk about you can use these tools in yeah. so many different ways and you have to set them up to reflect your culture and your values. Um, and you don't have to have a thousand people in a channel that's just chatting all the time. You, you can do things differently. Yeah, so that on that note, then remember to agree how you're using it. Don't despair. Mm. <laughs> we're despairing <laughs> because we're hearing a podcast. Don't despair. Just, uh, yeah, just agree. <laughs> um, okay, so I just wanted to end with another. I'm in, I'm in a very negative mood this week. Um, uh, maybe I'm thinking about... No. I think a lot of stuff is moving around the space a lot. And... Um, any ways that I would prefer it didn't, but you know, hey ho, that's how it is. But I think the um, this this thing that I'm coming across quite often, remote work is the future. I just wanted to end of that. It's going back to the high level, but I'm really reflecting that, um, and and this has come as a result of uh, pre preparing for our next uh, topic led episode, which is about uh, social change and remote work and how remote work can help social change. And I'm thinking that when we're saying things like remote work is the future, I think we need to start to be specific. This goes back to the space growing so much. Remote work is the future for knowledge workers. Um, because I'm, I'm worried that in doing that, we, I mean, we, we, we are, guilt is not the word, but yeah, we, are, I am definitely guilty in this podcast of we've focused always very much, pretty much on the knowledge worker. Uh, and, and a lot of, you know, the stuff I listen to and I read is, is about that. However, there are so many professions that cannot be done at a distance. So remote work is not the future for them. 
And I'm just thinking um, a couple of things. So David Berkus, who wrote Under New Management a couple of years ago, he didn't include remote work uh, in his book because it's not something that could happen across industries. He talked about unlimited holidays, uh, self-management, but not about remote work because he says that, that all industries cannot take that up. And the other thing is, Remote work can have so many, um, can reduce inequality, but I'm just wondering whether we're increasing inequality by having this, well, remote work is great, but only these people can do it. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe there's a, a, there's a sense that, yes, there is a great many things that can be done remotely nowadays, and it's increasing all of the time. But what we have always tried to talk about is doing remote well. And remote isn't necessarily the best way to do everything. I mean, for example, things like sales can be done remotely. There are an awful lot of industries moving now to more self-service and automated renewals of, of service contracts and things like that. But actually, maybe there are people, and not just in older generations, but people dealing with complexity for the first time who want to sit down with an advisor or so on. And I think there will always be room for jobs in every sector that can't be done remotely while at the same time we're exploring the bleeding edges of what can be done with things like remote surgery and things that you might never have thought possible to do remotely. So it's always going to be blended and remote work is the future is far too much of a simplification, I think. So maybe for me and anyone else who's (laughs) thinking along the same lines, I have to remember that we're still very early and that actually yeah. making statements like remote work is the future, what that does is it puts it on an equal par to other ways of working, and then we can move on from that. Yeah. Thank you for the therapy, Maya. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> All right, listeners, uh, virtualnotdistant.com for your long-form comments. If you want to tweet us at virtual teamwork with a zero instead of an O, let's start moving on to the main conversation today then. So we thought we'd talk about planned spontaneity. And this is something that, um, again, I don't know, sometimes I think I just, maybe I'm moving bubbles, Maya. So I go from from one bubble that only talks about that to another bubble. And I've really been hearing a lot about the concern with moving on to a form of online collaboration. Um, because, because, of course, in, 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 in the podcast, we look at remote work broadly, but we focus on virtual teams or f- office optional, just people working together online. And I do hear the, 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 the concern that we leave our human side behind and that all those things that we do like about being in the office with others, that they get lost. So... Yeah, I think I'd like to introduce listeners, if they haven't heard it before, to the concept of planned spontaneity. It's a great phrase, I think. Um, It contains a kind of inherent contradiction, and at the same time, it answers itself. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So I thought we'd start, we'd give this a little bit of a a thread. Um, So first of all, I think a lot of people do have a good reaction to the term and to the concept. So I think if we could start with looking at spontaneity, why mm. are we even looking at that? And then um, the fact that it's uh, the, the planned bit. So we'll, we'll dissect the term and then maybe we can have a look at um, teams and organizations and how some teams and organizations are adopting the concept. Of course, to say that uh, we are releasing at some point an online course on leading through visible teamwork and planned spontaneity is one of the concepts of visible teamwork. So that's another reason why I thought we could share it with listeners so that they know Mm. what is it that we are uh, preaching (laughs) when we preach. (laughs) We never preach. And practicing, we hope, as well. (laughs) Yes, we do. We do. We do. This one, yes, we do in particular. Um, So I was thinking, Maya, about spontaneity. What? What does it um, what does it give us as as human beings and specifically about human beings working with others? Do you want to have a bash or shall I go from the notes? That's interesting. Well, I I think the whole idea of spontaneity is something that's very innate and primal because it comes from when we had to survive in a complex environment with different species and so on, sort of way back before we probably before we even had language, we had to be alert for change and discovering things and being surprised by things and being prepared to deal with that. 
And so we look for it and we feel rewarded by innovation and novelty. And that's why we need we need that kind of stimulus, even if our work's quite routine. We we want things to happen that are slightly unexpected, not, you know, completely blow our day away, but <laughs> Little sort of touches of, of, of surprise and things that it's stimulating and, and helps keep us on track. And we need to make sure, therefore, when we're designing the remote workspace that, that we allow for that. We don't sort of plan everything um, and isolate people into their work functions. There has to be those nice little nudges of interaction. Yeah, and uh, I... I... I like that the the bit about um especially if our work is very structured or, or routine or repetitive that in in the spontaneity can come from our interaction with with others rather than in the work itself. Um also let's not well let's remember this goes from some of the conversations we were having in the previous section that Remote work sometimes sounds very glamorous, like, oh, fantastic, I can work from anywhere. But the reality is that a lot of people work from the same place. So mm -hmm. <laughs> some people will have that ability to incorporate something spontaneous into their work by changing their location or changing their routines. Others won't. So we're saying, well, there's another layer where you can add that bit of, like Maya says, that that innate uh, want to to be alert and 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 readjusting to our environment uh, continuously. And so we can provide that. Yeah, it probably is something related to the introversion extroversion spectrum as well. Whether you, how much you need and want that kind of spontan spontaneous change versus wanting things to stay the same. Um, but it's sort of a self-awareness thing then of what, what do I need? What does my team need in, in order to be motivated and fulfilled and happy? Yeah, that's really important that, 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 we, that we understand who we're doing this for uh, and, that, that, and the diversity that's there and accounting, accounting for that. Um, I'm also wondering sometimes in this uh, state of, and, and this maybe comes from being in a profession where you're continuously um, being self-aware, etc. Uh, but I think also sometimes through spontaneous interaction with others, you also realize stuff about yourself. I think there's also sometimes a discovery of self, like, um, I don't know, I just had this kind of conversation and, oh, wow, I really enjoyed that. But because I'd never had that yeah. conversation <laughs> and because I hadn't planned for it, um, oh, that's interesting. Definitely. And it, I think it's easy to overlook that if you are quite an introverted, hermity, writery type, speaking for myself. I think you can sometimes, you know, you think you, you know exactly what you think or feel about something or how, how you're reacting to an issue. And actually, the value of having a little unplanned conversation about it or just seeing what somebody else thinks in somewhere you hadn't expected can really shift the way you think. Yeah, you always bring that up. It's really good <laughs> because I always forget that that that, that happens. Um, and even when we're looking at like uh, writing and sharing in writing or taking the time to wrap up the day or having those open conversations even, that that element of uh, through our interactions, we discover what we think, who we are. Um, yeah. Um, and, and I'm also thinking whether... With a sometimes, and of course, we're talking about spontaneity. A lot of the time it's got to do with informality. So if it's not planned in a work setting, it can have that more informal feel, which of course gives us a whole different layer of interactions. And I'm just wondering whether because of these, what will happen and And even if it doesn't matter, even if it's just a coffee, but you're a little bit more alert, maybe you're also a little bit more gutsy as in in your gut rather than in your head. And maybe by having these spontaneous interactions, maybe we get to know the real person better, which could be good or bad. <laughs> yeah, I think there's definitely a, a often a strong case for getting out of your own head and even, you know, enabling those kind of intuitions, which we know, thanks to Gladwell and other people, are actually coming from your head, <laughs> but they're, they're coming in slices that you can't really articulate when you overthink things. So sometimes you need an external perspective or a new way of looking at things. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering also whether it's um, this, if we're talking about spontaneity in the uh, remote ecosystem, whether it's also part of staying nimble as a team. And again, if especially if our work tends to be quite routine, it's 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 always good not to lose those muscles that help us to then operate in different kinds of situations. Another thing, um, thinking creativity also again for the same reason that keeping keeping you on um, on your toes. 
helps creativity also because uh, mm. creativity is about having maybe new ideas or making connections between different things. And again, maybe just this uh, keeping ourselves a little bit uh, on edge, <laughs> almost. I mean, I'm making this sound really terrible. Um, whether that, I don't know. I haven't got a clue. Listeners, you, you <laughs> let us know what you think because um, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm just making all this up still. Well, I think it's coming from a, a sense of a feeling that this this matters and that this is true, even if we haven't got research to back it up. It's it's coming from our personal experiences. Of, you know, I know that if I'm stuck on something creatively, maybe I'll go for a walk or something, just so that I'm looking at things I hadn't expected, or you know, I'm looking for that spontaneity in my life to maybe unstick something. So it, it does make a difference. And of course, spontaneity means that it leaves space also for things to go wrong. <laughs> because <laughs> when we don't have everything sorted uh, and um, and of course that happens and I think it's it's interesting because for example I'll give you a very concrete example of something that happened uh, you know the other day when we, we we woke up to a Trello board that had been I don't know gremlined Maya <laughs> <laughs> you'd been added to a card two or three checklists with nothing had been added to a thing there was all kinds of strange stuff and yeah, I don't know. We still don't really know what happened, but Ross had been in in yeah. some shape or form. I hope he wasn't hacked or something. Um, and and again, but that also that uh, we were we were saying it's the equivalent of him coming in and destroyed the office a little bit, or or left all this <laughs> stuff lying around. And he he actually said it was a little bit like coming into the office drunk. Um, and I think which he meant very metaphorically. Yes, I'm sure. yes definitely. <laughs> I don't know that that spontaneity. Of course, uh, we, we're saying we hadn't done anything, we hadn't planned for it. I suppose the fact that we use Trello, which we all see and that we all share, is a little bit of of that. We're we're making that happen. I think also that um, it just allows also things for go a little bit wrong in the online space again in ways that don't matter. So I, I wonder if this is important. I'm sure it is because it's in those those spaces where you get a little bit experimental that often you have interesting breakthroughs and things provided you have a psychologically safe environment in which to do that mm -hmm. there's no blame if somebody writes weird things on a trello card or, <laughs> or whatever happens or somebody tries something new in a client interaction or in creating content or whatever you can afford to be a bit experimental a bit spontaneous um and who knows you know it, it might create something really unexpected and brilliant yeah it could be we still need to dig into this it could be that he's found out a way a quick way of uh, going in or that he's found out a way of um or something that we should be looking out for uh maybe on yes our... so ross if you're listening when you're editing this safe space tell us what you did <laughs> <laughs> what happened um yeah. okay so we we're, we're making the case for spontaneity in, uh, in different degrees um then let's go to the first part of this planned thing mm. which as we know in the online space um if you don't plan stuff it's very difficult well is it is it difficult if you don't plan it to be spontaneous in the online space maya well, you have to open up the windows for that spontaneous interaction to happen. I like the fact that we have a Trello card for each podcast episode rather than, I don't know, we could have a static document or, you know, something really prescriptive. Whereas instead, we've got this quite dynamic app where we can put all the information and files that we need. But there's also space for comments, um, for emojis, for um, strange checklists to appear, but then for other people to notice them and reflect on them. Um, it, it's those kind of little bits of functionality around the edges that creates that spontaneity. And I think you do have to choose what application you're going to use what and how you're going to use it in order to put those spaces in place for the spontaneity to happen. And we are assuming, especially in the way we're talking about, that there's, a, there's an ability by everyone to work in the cloud and online mm. in shared spaces, uh, which which I wonder whether it's still holding some people back or if it really is still in the head. Um, but we could have um, our own checklists, in, uh, for example, about the episodes, like you could have your own checklist, my, I could have mine and Ross uh, on our computers. But in putting them together, we've created that open space and the open space that allows for interactions allows for spontaneity. Yes, and it reduces duplication and yeah. friction and things like that. And maybe that opens up more space for that that kind of spontaneity. But I do think the the thing about shared tools is really important here. I don't see how you could be spontaneous over email. Well, you could, but it just you you, you could, but it's just really 
I don't know, it's clunky. It's um it's not yeah. as conducive, I think. But 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 maybe we're wrong. Um I have to say that I've been recently using <laughs> made to use <laughs> email as a as a conversation tool and I found it very difficult, but I am again I'm going back to has this been a bubble that uh, we've been living yeah. in where actually st- a lot of people do still use email as a conversation tool when actually there are better spaces for that. Yeah, yeah it's true. Actually, I've, I've come across that simile in a team I've been working with where it's not unusual to get a reply all with a single emoji in it. Yeah, that's fine. Which is just like using email to react. Yes, yes. <laughs> Why have I got an inbox alert about for a, you know... Mm. Flo- a flamingo. Yes, it's funny. It is, it's, it's funny. That's just not what I ever thought email was for. So maybe that there is room for that spontaneity to work its way into different ways of interacting. People will find a way. Maybe it proves the need for it, actually, a kind of human hunger for that kind of yes. kind of little little edges of humanity yeah. to creep into work. Yeah, and so you're you're also making me think that the importance of this planning also, and if we if we look at it from the point of view of the change agent or the manager or team leader, this planning is not just about planning, but about role modeling and about planning to role model. So we're going to take our cues if we come into a conversation where or into a team where it's quite common for people to do that, exactly what you just said, just send an emoji or whatever mm-hmm. reaction, when we're probably going to buy into that, whereas if it's not, then we won't. So in this planning, there's a lot of role modeling and um, an experimentation, I imagine. Uh, definitely. And I think, you know, we, we talk a lot about having team agreements and being quite structured about how you're going to decide you're going to use tools. And maybe this is the one area where it's hard to be that prescriptive. You can be very specific about the work, how you're going to use tools. We're going to have this kind of update here and we expect that there. But the more spontaneous stuff is going to evolve as part of your culture and it's the kind of thing that people will pick up by that role modelling and seeing what's acceptable and what's normal and so on. So it's something for team leaders and change makers to be very conscious and intentional about if they want to introduce a change or guide people down a certain pathway of using it because you're not likely to put in your team agreement we will send particular kinds of emojis yes. when somebody has had a really rubbish day or <laughs> you know you're not going to write that down but you can show it and you can establish it yeah good point um so also i was thinking that we're well i'm hearing a lot of remote being used for hybrid teams and organizations so again organizations where you have some people in the office and others aren't and again it's being conscious of this concept and like maya was saying and all the role modeling that goes around with as well as the tech ecosystem being conscious of how we can use that to level the playing field between people mm. in the office and not and 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 it might be that um uh, the way it might be happening I, I wonder whether this will happen is that at some point we get a better experience when we're remote than when we're in the office i think we always have to i think traditionally we've always thought of the remote workers being the ones with the worst experience but actually i think mm-hmm. it could go either way um and by but by setting stuff that everyone can access so it really doesn't matter where you are then you're thinking of systems that help everyone be spontaneous with each other definitely and if people even in the same building find that everything that all of their needs being met by the remote communication tools then they can they won't need to go outside of it and have separate conversations that exclude the remote teams. so with all of that <laughs> what are some of the things that um that that people are doing uh and the the most common one and this is really common now i think it's i think it's great is having some sort of place where you can go to talk w- w- without a uh, without a plan um some people mm. m- have like a mandatory that it has to be informal but other times it's just okay we, well there is the expectation that it's okay not to talk about work when we're together here um and of course github have an open video call and also we've also seeing um, bots being used to pair people so again it's not very spontaneous that something tells you who you're going to be paired with and having a conversation however when you have a distributed workforce, unless someone says, look, why don't you and you get together and talk? It's not going to happen. So No, it's not. And it's okay, I think. And I think there's growing kind of acceptance of that. It, it reminds me a little bit about the way that dating has changed oh, over yeah. the last couple of decades. You know, it's a, it would have been 
sort of something quite negative, the idea of using an app to meet somebody. Um, and, whereas now it's completely normal, apparently, having not been in that world for a long time. The, you know, the, the social acceptability of being matched by something and then taking it onto the human level is okay. So I think it should be the same in the remote workspace, an app saying, right, you two have a virtual coffee, see how you go. You probably might not hit it off or have anything in common, or you might connect over something completely unexpected and uh, and and like in other way parts of uh, our remote teamwork we are allowing technology to take away some of that work that actually maybe takes a lot of brain space but actually can be automated uh, so th this is the equivalent of someone knowing everyone in the company and saying oh sending an email introduction <laughs> hey yeah. you why don't you meet with you but actually the donut is doing it and it's doing them randomly which is even more interesting Yeah, and just imagine as these things get smarter and smarter, then they will become well, probably more like sort of the dating apps or something. I'm just really, you know, both of these people have been tweeting about Game of Thrones recently <laughs> or something. We'll put them together for a coffee yeah. or, you know, there might be sort of layers of creepy intelligence <laughs> coming to that. I don't know. Haven't haven't seen anything about that. <laughs> Let us know if you have, listeners, virtualnotdistant.com. Yeah. So Donut is a, a, a common bot that's used often integrated into Slack. I wonder whether the office... Uh, 365 micro uh, ecosystem has anything similar probably not at the moment but whether it might come I wouldn't be surprised yes. uh, whether they will buy donut um so that is yes probably <laughs> that is one and it's that thing that uh, trello used to do this manually and now of course they've got a bot doing it so again it's experimenting with that and i think going from so um the Sorry, I've, I've completely jumped into organizations. We didn't do teams. So maybe we can carry on with organizations and then go back to, to, to teams. Yeah. Sorry. So I took this from a, a white paper uh, and I'm going to quote directly because I think it's, it's, it's really important. It says online social networks. So it was looking at the benefits of using social networks, open social networks like LinkedIn, Twitter, etc. And it was saying online social networks at work facilitate continuous employee communication, which promotes awareness Awareness of and helps employees better understand the roles and responsibilities of colleagues in other departments. This helps employees mm. feel a part of the whole, increasing employee satisfaction at work. This is a slightly different take because we've been talking about the informality and getting people, to, getting to know people outside of their work role. But actually, I think both are quite connected. Definitely. And it's it's interesting because so many of the tools that we use for those informal internal things have come to us from the big social network space, the idea of threaded conversations and liking and reacting and things like that. So it's it's like it's coming full circle now. And, and those same tools are reminding us of our role within a bigger organization. Yeah, helping us find our place with not just within the team, but within the enterprise. I don't remember whether this is something that we spoke to on the on on online on the air with Matt Ballantyne or whether it was a follow-up conversation where he was saying well so you know he was working with a company I think and they were saying oh we we need our internal social network and he said why well, you've got LinkedIn and yeah. something I'm noticing and I don't know if, whether that's just my own network that has changed is I am noticing people in organizations uh, in larger organizations corporations not in the distributed space necessarily Um, giving kudos to their colleagues, to their employees, to their direct reports, to their bosses online on LinkedIn. Yeah, that's really lovely to see. Actually, it's it's this sense of, of being recognized in the wider world that gives a context to what people are doing within their, their work and their occupation. So I think it's a great trend. Yeah, and I think it also makes me think that people are more and more online on the social networks to keep up with their colleagues rather than necessarily yeah. finding out beyond. Um, and I don't know if you've noticed, but a couple of times, and, and again, haha, this is the platform manipulating you or are they following what people want? <laughs> because, I, um, and this might be part of what Microsoft is doing because let's remember who owns LinkedIn. I've, I don't know if you've noticed it, Maya, but I've every now and then I've been prompted, okay, Find your colleagues at Virtual Not Distant. Keep up with the people that matter most. So it's actually it's asking me whether I want to prioritize and to give um, give more visibility in my feed to people I work with. Yes, which probably has more meaning in slightly well, larger yes. organizations than Virtual Not Distant. <laughs> yes. It's like, yes, I found a large. It's over there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But if you're part of a huge enterprise, then you probably have no idea even what different business units within it are doing in different parts of the world and so yeah. on. So 
LinkedIn is trying to be that that platform that connects you outside of your formal work communications. So it's quite powerful. I think this is so interesting where we've come from, from being monitored and forbidden sometimes from using social networks at work <laughs> to now them being integrated into our internal communications. Yes. And recognizing the value to brands as well for having good advocacy on social media, for having people who are out there doing visible mm. things, um, recognizing that publicly um, and, you know, being seen in all enhances the, the brand value and the, often your employees are the, the best people to talk about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing that in organizations there is value at, at, at all kinds of levels and of course we've also talked previously on the show about building those informal networks at work that are helping that will help us to stay healthy really so that we're not always just Um, networking with our closer colleagues. So we can see the value in that. We can see the value for organizations to be doing some of this and thinking about it. How about at the team level? Um, is there, I mean, don't we have enough interactions already with our team members to have to then be planning how to be spontaneous? Well, we We have to plan it at some <laughs> point just to make sure it's there to be spontaneous, I think. It's important that it doesn't create friction for its own sake. And I think some of these apps about pairing people up and stuff like that work much better at scale when there's you really probably don't know the people in another part of the organization. Within teams, it probably has to come more from the team leader to foster that kind of connection, to really know the people they're working with and to at least at the leadership level, to allocate some time and resource to making sure that connection happens. It takes us back to the uh, research we were looking at before, the one that came, that came off the Yahoo um, article, where it said that uh, managers spent like uh, more than an hour uh, a day with uh, informal chat. And I think that comes yes. from this. It comes from the fact that uh, it, it, it's good practice to really get to know your people. <laughs> um, Definitely. And actually, it reminds me of our previous podcast when we were looking at the journey to leadership. And I, th I think it was Marcus Vermouth said mm. that he found one of, the, one of the transitions was he wasn't being productive as an engineer anymore because he was spending all this time talking to people. And that was it was hard to measure the tangible benefit of that. But that's That's management, isn't it? And it's something that I think people face in all kinds of transitions to a more supervisory role that you suddenly you're spending a lot of time on this woollier, softer stuff. Um, but it's so important. Yeah. And the, the spontaneous nature of some of these conversations might mean that um, instead of coming, I think instead of coming to the meeting or to the conversation with a plan, okay, this is what I'm going to say, it might again be easier to find exactly where that person is at, at that very moment. Um, yeah, what they need, and they might have a crisis or a personal issue, or they might have something's blown up in the work or whatever. And it's, it's the manager's job sometimes to put their own stuff aside and deal spontaneously with that. Mm -hmm that's what's needed. And so this, uh, whether we're having um, uh, virtual coffees or, or or other ways, for example, of finding that we're online with each other, because this, this concept of showing that we are available to others is part of that planned spontaneity. It's very difficult to mm. tap someone on the shoulder if we don't know if we're going to disturb them. So that is also part of, of that ecosystem. Um, And it also, so all of these things that we're doing are also part of building trust and helping people understand more where they're at with other people and, uh, and, and knowing what, and I think also what tends to happen when we have spontaneous interactions, sometimes we, um, there's the opportunity to, to share our values a bit more, to share behavior and the behavior reflects our values. Uh, whereas that kind of conversation might never happen in the more, this is what we're getting at now um, space. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's bringing more of yourself to an interaction because it's not planned to communicate something specific about the work mm -hmm. when you, you get a chance to just make a quick remark about something because you're, you both happen to be in a document at the same time, for example, or you can, I, I wouldn't send somebody an email to say, I love that set that paragraph in in that document yes yes exactly <laughs> i probably wouldn't phone them up to do that whereas i could just you know i could if i can just quickly chuck a comment into a google doc and say oh lovely um that that says something about how i feel about them or the point they're making or beautiful writing or, or whatever it is but it's it's kind of throwaway and, and immediate but actually says something about me and what i value as much as it says 
something about the work that we're working on together. Because you bring in another point, which I think is often missed when I'm hearing conversations about finding these spaces. They're all often called a virtual water cooler. And as someone who mm. um, never hang around the water cooler, <laughs> I, never, I can never relate to that. Um, but it is that these are things we can also have this spontaneous interaction around the work and on the work. It's not always about informality. Uh, sorry, it's not always about non-work related conversations. So as you were mentioning, if again, if our ecosystem means that we um, we can see when someone is working on a document, if our work involves that, that allows for, uh, for that. One word of warning, I don't know what's going on with Google Docs. Every time I send mm. a chat, not just to you, to someone else the other day, no one's getting it. And that is the worst thing is that you have these systems. So everyone looks like, um, so for example, and, and this is this is something that's going on with the app, I can see that. Maya was there and I'm sending her messages and I'm getting nothing. Yeah. Yeah. There is something happening with, and they're probably just changing something or, you know, going to push an update soon, but, but it kind of, that, that shows you how much we value those little spontaneous interactions because of how you feel if, if it's not n noticed yeah. or acknowledged. It's like, oh, um, so I think an awful lot of these cloud tools have recognized the value of it and they're building in things like Like the fact you can see someone's writing a comment in Slack or in Trello, you can see yeah. so and so is is doing this right now, and that's lovely and spontaneous. But when it doesn't work, it kind of cuts people off and leaves them a little bit high and dry. So yeah, sort it out with the dogs, please. <laughs> and it's a great <laughs> reminder that if we are setting up these uh, systems, if they don't work because we're not using them or for whatever reason, remove them. Officially yes. say, okay, we're not going to use that chat or. Don't assume that because you see me logged into Slack that I'm there. Because this is another one is yeah. that we might have agreed to share availability, but then we forget or whatever. And someone is just trying to get, you know, trying to say hello and we're not there. So I think it's also a reminder that to continuously review what we've agreed on, because actually if these things are implemented, but they're not followed and removed, if they're not working for whatever reason, they can actually do a little bit of damage. Yeah, conversations can get lost, emotional reactions can get lost. And because the platforms are continually changing and adding new functionality or making some things not work as well as they did before in this particular case we're discussing, then we need to keep that under review as well. Hopefully the tools are moving towards more and better, but sometimes they don't take a straight line there and go off and you know remove something that you found is useful. Or alternatively, there are now so many ways that we can interact spontaneously through different aspects of the work that it's easier to miss one. So those agreements about how you're going to use things it become ever more important. Mm -hmm. So we've uh, shared some uh, some ideas, some things that are happening. Of course, we didn't. Re uh, we did, I wanted to mention also in a hybrid setup, this company, I think they're in Germany, that has a webcam and a monitor by their coffee machine in the office. So that when, uh, <laughs> uh, so remote people can also be part of that. So th that is like a high level <laughs> creating. It's funny, isn't it? Yeah. And it, but it's, it's going back to that sense that in the co-located space, you have to go to somewhere. Yes like to have coffee or water yeah. or a cigarette or whatever. Whereas in the virtual space, it's, it's more spontaneous. I think it's easier to be spontaneous. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, so there's, the, there's those, those high level examples. And then we've got the little small team examples that like, yeah, use Trello, which tells you that someone else is on the card or whatever. So I think the important thing is the concept that we, we, we understand it, that we honor it and that we uh, see how it can help us. Because that's in the end of the day, The important thing is it helping us? Yes. So, uh, call to action. Um, well, we'd love to uh, hear from you if you have implemented anything, whatever it is, even if it's something similar to something that we've covered. It'd be lovely to share with other listeners. Virtualnotdistant.com. We do have a course, an online course coming up called Leading Through Visible Teamwork, and we cover planned spontaneity. We probably don't cover much more than we've covered in the podcast, but we cover it a lot more succinctly and uh, and slowly. So we shall yes, more actionably. Yes. Hopefully, because we've gone all over the place today. I think the other call to action is if you've noticed something that we haven't talked about happening within your teams or the way a tool is being purposed, but maybe not how it was originally designed, I think it's it's sometimes really fascinating to see how people have evolved their own ways of connecting 
on these different cloud-based apps. So please tell us if you've, if you've come up with something novel as a way to connect spontaneously. Wonderful. So we would love to receive your um, unplanned emails. <laughs> we love, please give <laughs> us that hit of, oh, look, they got in touch. Uh, do send, uh, you can send them to me. I'll, I'll be the first one to get that hit. Pilar at yeah. virtualnotdistant.com. If you want to send a file, uh, if you want to just um, um, uh, talk to us by a text, then please use the contact form on virtualnotdistant.com because then we will both have that little... <gasps> Oh, hey, it's arrived at the same time. All right, listeners, we'll leave you now with the stock outro. A big thank you for listening to the 21st Century Work-Life Podcast produced by Virtual Not Distant. If you have something to add to the conversation, let us know through the contact form over at virtualnotdistant.com. I have been your host, Pilar Orti, and I'm signing off now. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, enjoy. Enjoy.